Welcome to the Bounce Back to Breakthrough podcast. I'm your host, Ross Rolf, and I'm here to guide you through this journey. In each episode, we meet remarkable guests who have experienced profound setbacks that shattered their lives, yet they've managed to rebuild and achieve breakthroughs that inspire all of us. Now, this podcast does come with a trigger warning. Before we begin, a quick reminder to brace yourself. This journey we're about to embark on isn't always easy, but it is deeply rewarding. Get ready to uncover the insights, strategies, and lessons that these incredible guests we have on here have experienced, and these journeys and insights will help you on your own journey. Today, I'm speaking to Mark Snell, and I'm absolutely honored to have him in the studio. Mark, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Ross, for having me on. And it's a pleasure to be on the podcast with you today. Really good to have you here, Mark. I've I've obviously seen quite a bit of your story, I'd say, over the last year. But we haven't actually met in person yet, although we are meeting soon, aren't we? We are going to meet soon, which yes, will be really good. Next Friday, I noticed that you were coming to the uh, event, Ross. Yeah, so we're going to a Netflix premiere together, red carpet. So yeah, hopefully you'll see some pictures about that. They will actually be out probably before this episode. You'll probably see them pictures, but you can always dig back if you're listening to them to see us. I know from the small amount that I do know of you already, because I always, as I said to you before, just before we start the recording, I don't like to know too much about people beforehand, especially the, the whole story, because I like to try and hear it a bit more firsthand and ask the questions that our listeners will be thinking when they hear, hear what you're saying. And I know you've had quite a journey. Yes. So tell us about where you've come from to get into where you are today. Definitely. So I think I'll start out at the beginning, you know, always a good place to start. Yeah, let's do so, it. Get your popcorn um, ready, people. Here we go. Yeah. So I'm from a town called Chesterfield, which is, if anybody knows where Chesterfield is, when I say that to people, they're like, where's that? And I always say it's near Sheffield. Okay. Small Derbyshire town. And when I was growing up, I was brought up by my nan and my granddad. Okay. Because my mum had me at a really young age. And I was always a bit different from as a child from being very, very young. So I always found it really difficult to socialize, you know. So most kids, when they're, you know, at a young age, if they're asked to go to a party, they jump at the, you know, at the opportunity to go there. Whereas I was one of those kids where if I was asked to go to a party, it'd be like, no, you know, I don't want to spend any time in those sort of social settings. And this was from a really young age, probably from the age of about six or seven. And, you know, as I was going through school, I was a big kid. You can imagine, can't you, you know, being brought up by your nan, you know what nans are like, you know, they give you chocolate, they give you sweets, they, you know, they spoil you rotten. And so as I was going through primary school, I was a really big kid. And I I think I got to about year five or year six. And I'd I'd been teased quite a lot. I'd been teased because of my name, first of all, Mark Snell. So as you can imagine, I got all of the jokes, Mark Smell. You know, I was the, yeah, I got picked on quite a lot all the way throughout school. So... I didn't really realize the effect that that was having on me, you know, being quite sh a shy child anyway. I'd started to develop a belief about myself that I wasn't good enough. And when I got up to secondary school, I started at secondary school and I was aware of my sexuality from a very young age. You know, I was aware that I was gay from probably about the age of about 13. So obviously that was different. And then, you know, that also in itself, you know, not being able to accept my sexuality reaffirmed that belief that, you know, that I was different to everybody else and that I wasn't, I wasn't good enough. So from a very early age, I'd made that decision. And a lot of the clients that I've gone on to work with, you know, I find have that core limiting belief of I'm not good enough. So anyway, I'd gone throughout school and, you know, I was I was quite a rebellious teenager. So 
from the age of 15, me and my best friend, Laura, we used to sneak over to Manchester on a, on a Friday night and go to Canal Street in Manchester. Which if if any of the listeners don't don't know what Canal Street is, it's like a huge, big gay scene, clubbing scene in Manchester. My parents thought that I was staying over at a friend's house, you know, because I couldn't exactly say at the age of 15 to my nan, oh, yeah, I'm going out clubbing all weekend and, you know, and getting completely off my head. And obviously, I, you know, I got involved with, the, you know, with the clubbing scene and the club that I went to was the largest gay club in the UK. Three floors. It was open till seven o'clock the next morning. And I remember the first time that I went to, you know, to to that club. I couldn't understand why everyone was able to dance until the early hours of the morning. I was going to say then, Mark, 7 a.m. I mean, especially nowadays, I'd be in bed by about half 10. It would barely be in the open then, wouldn't it? Exactly. I mean, now, you know, I'm I'm asleep by like half nine, 10 o'clock most nights now, Ross. You know, I just... Would you... How long would you last there that till then, that club? Um, If if I was in a club now, I could probably last until about two, two, three o'clock-ish. Do you know what I mean? Before I need to, you know, to, to, to go home. But I, I got involved with drugs because, as you can imagine, a club like that, everyone was off the face. And I I got involved with ecstasy, first of all. So, you know, it was a party drug at the time. You know, I used drugs recreationally from the age of about 15 up until the age of 17. And then when I was 17, I met a guy who I got involved with and... I didn't really know what I was letting myself in for when I met him because the first date that we had, we went back to his afterwards and he asked me what I was insecure about the first time that I met him. So I told him everything that I was unconfident about and insecure about in myself. And, you know, that that relationship turned really, really nasty because I wasn't, I didn't even know, you don't know at that age that people are capable of, you know, manipulating people in that way and and having those narcissistic personality traits. Um, and over the space of the, you know, the two years that I was with him from, you know, being 17 to 19, he was physically abusive and mentally abusive. But I think you, after a while of being in an abusive relationship, you get used to the physical violence, but you never really get used to the the mental violence, the manipulation, the playing on all of your insecurities to get you into a really, really low place so that person can control you even more. And, you know, I spent two years with him of, of hell until, you know, I got to the age of 19 and I was like, I don't want to be in this situation anymore. You know, I was like, I need to get out of this situation. And I did. Was you living together or anything at that point? So what had happened is he, he, after the first year of us being together, he moved over to Chesterfield and he got a flat just around the corner from where my mum lived. So he was virtually on my on my doorstep. And then when I split up with him, he was he was stalking me. So he'd wait outside work. He turned up at my mum's back door numerous times with a knife in his hand, threatening to, to cut his wrist and take his own life. And I got to the point where I, I just needed to get out of there. And at the age of 19, I moved over to Manchester on my own and lived in privately owned student halls, 200 quid a month, all bills included, you know, bargain. You wouldn't get that now. (laughs) You wouldn't. (laughs) And I, you know, I'd moved over to Manchester. But as you can imagine, you know, going through all of that Mm. and I was just lost. I didn't know who I was. I had no confidence at all. The only time I ever had confidence to be able to socialize with anybody was when I'd had speed or or pills or a line of coke. That is the only time I had that confidence. So 
you know, from the age of 19, like the, you know, the times that I, I you know, I, I stayed in Manchester for a number of years and, and things progressively got worse with the drugs because, you know, I'd, I'd use them socially. I used them when I was going out clubbing, but then I became friends and, you know, it was a sad situation because she's unfortunately no longer here, but I met my best friend, Sam. And Sam was one of those people that when you meet her, you would never forget her. She was a hippie. She was a short, she used to call herself the camp lesbian because <laughs> she was literally a camp lesbian. And we just got along like a house on fire, but she, she got involved with, you know, with selling drugs and dealing to fund our own habit. But then, you know, it became a daily usage of the drugs then because people would come around to the house to come and pick up their stuff. Um, we would we'd have a line with them at like sometimes 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. And then it would just carry on and it just all molded into one. And then we we got involved with some people that were injecting. And I was always scared of needles, you know, even talking about it now. I still have some shame around what I did. And it's surprising, though, when something becomes normalized in a social circle, mm. it becomes acceptable to do that thing. So, you know, it was a, only a matter of time before I was also injecting speed and, and crystal as well. And that just took things to a whole different level because... I became really selfish. I became not a nice person to be around. As soon as I didn't have the drugs, my patience to get the drugs was that low that the journey to go and get them, you know, was just frustrating, really, really frustrating. And I turned into a person that I didn't know. And um, I couldn't work. I wasn't able to hold down a job at mm. all. And um, so... In the end, you know, I'd sold everything that I had. I was living in a tent on my friend's back garden and I just thought I need to get money. So the only thing that I had left to sell was myself. And that's when I got pulled into the sex industry, which on top of not feeling good enough as it is already and having that core limiting belief, it just spiraled on from there and Throughout that time, though, because I did make quite a lot of money when I was working as an escort, I was able to get my own flat, I got my own place, and I'd use the more money I made, the more drugs I took. To the point where it was, you know, it was a lot of money that I, I was spending on drugs. You know, I have nothing to show from all the money that I made from that. And I'd the turning point for me was psychosis. Because I don't know if any of the listeners have ever experienced psychosis in any way, but it's scary. Um, and when it first happened, I lived in a 15th floor flat in a tower block. I think at this point, Mark, the listeners are probably all here with their mouths open. It just, I mean, what you've been through even up to this point, I'm like, wow, you know, it that is unbelievable what you've gone through. And this is all, mm. it's worth pointing out. I mean, this has all started when you're 17. So still legally a child, yeah. mentally very much still a child. Yeah. What was that partner older than you? That first one. The first partner was older than me. Yeah, he was. Mm. Yeah. So he was in his late, well, late thirties. So really um, exploiting you while you're, while you're young and yeah. impressionable and, I think people, one of the things you mentioned about early on in that part when you were talking about him is about asking about them insecurities. Yeah. Obviously, now you would know that's a big, that would be a big red flag. You'd be thinking, well, oh, why does someone I've just met want to know what I'm insecure about? Mm -hmm. And that's obviously used as a weapon to help control you. So, yeah, I mean, obviously, listeners, you, you're probably thinking the same. That's why I just thought I'd bring that up. Another key point I just want to bring up, Mark, that you mentioned so far, because people are probably... They're still there with their mouths open about what, what you're telling us. But mm. one of the things you were saying about is when it, when things become normalized and yeah. it's that social circle and everyone else is doing it. Yeah. That that's why as coaches, we often say to people about you've got to put yourself with people that are the sort of people you want to be or 
or already ahead of you where you want to be, right? Mm-hmm. Because if if you hang around, you know, nine other drug users, you become the tenth. So you, w- when we say to people about who you're around and the impressions and how how that does affect you, it does affect you. And and Mark's given you a real life example of that there. Okay, so if you're looking at your own social circles, if they do not align with where you want to be, it's much easier said than done. Don't get me wrong. But if you're looking at them and you're like, that is not the sort of person I want to be, then get yourself out of there, guys. Get yourself out of there because you will end up being like them if that's what you're staying around, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's so true. It's so true. You absorb the the you know the mindset. You absorb collectively their beliefs and their views of the world mm. um, as well. You really have got to protect your energy from you know from other people and it's when it it, it's true because once i i found recovery after that you know after the psychosis the seeing the people the worst was seeing black figures in coats walking past my window that were demons i was convinced that my next door neighbor had put recording equipment in my flat I, i i remember one night being awake at like whatever o'clock it was in the morning and I I tipped the bed upside down the base of the bed because it was like it was a divan and I tipped the sofa up and I cut the bottom of the sofa because I was convinced that there was recording equipment by my neighbor inside the sofa Wow! and it was all real you know because part of you knows it's not real and another part no it's very real because you can feel it you can see it you can hear it and I knew then that 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 was the turning point for me and i found recovery i went to narcotics anonymous i did you know i joined the 12 week program and that's when i realized to the extent of the social anxiety and the public speaking fears because i'd removed the plaster i'd taken away the the confidence trick i'd taken away the drugs so i was left feeling all of those suppressed emotions that I've been running away from for for so many years, really. And that's when the real work began. How long was the psychosis going on for, Mark? To be honest, when I think about it now, the psychosis had been going on for quite a long time because the paranoia was there for for a while and it had built up to the point of the hallucinations. Mm. And because the hallucination, I'd spend four, five, six days away with no sleep with like wow. bare minimal food. I, if I'd have carried on, I wouldn't have been here. You know, I wouldn't have been alive now. I wouldn't have been on this podcast with you tonight. So when I stopped the drugs, the psychosis lingered because it does linger until the drugs have completely left your system. But when you've caught up on your sleep, it starts to, you know, it starts to get better. But I knew that I had to make a change then because I thought if I carry this on, I might go into a psychosis that I never come out of. Mm. you know because that does happen yeah and was it that the, the session you were talking about then when you when you, you know, about patting the bed and stuff like that was what, yeah. what, what was the final one that you was the one that broke the straw on the camel's back as it as it were it what to be honest with you what, what it was the psychosis but it was also it was also that it, I, I remember coming down from the drugs after that psychosis, after, you know, after all of that had happened and that, you know, and this is, this is quite embarrassing to say this really, to be honest, but obviously, you know, you know about me now, you know that I worked in the sex industry. So I'd got to a point where I I sat down and I thought to myself, I've had that many people come into my, come into my home that that I've been with that, I could be walking down the street and I wouldn't even recognize them. And I just felt really, I've just felt really disgusted with myself. And I just, I just thought if I don't stop this now, I could end up dying. And then what's going to happen to my mom? What's going to happen to my nan? What's going to happen to my sisters? How are they going to feel? And I I think I I just got to the point where I stopped thinking selfishly. And I realized how selfish I'd been. And I just, that was it. It was just one of those moments. It was just like, no, I'm not prepared to do this anymore. And that's when I went to, you know, get the help. 
But how did you how did you know about Narcotics Anonymous? Was it was it kind of signposted to you by someone, or did you you know did you go to doctor for help? How did how did that start? It was the internet. Um, yeah, it was the internet. So I'd go, I'd literally just gone onto you know good old Google and you know looked at you know help and programs, and then you know I came across NA. And I looked for where my nearest meeting was. And I, when I went to my first meeting, it was nerve wracking because I shared at that meeting and I was a nervous wreck, you know, just, you know, with, with the, you know, the social anxiety as well, sharing in front of all those people. But for the first time in my life, it's a bit like coaching because for the first time in my life, I'd been fully listened to. Mm. And I told my story and I came out of that first meeting and I'd committed at that meeting to go to a meeting a day for 30 days because in Manchester, obviously it's a big city. So, you know, you've got meetings all over the place. So I got myself a bus ticket and I went to a meeting every single day, a full NA meeting every single day for 30 days. And then at the end of the 30 days, I got a sponsor. I did some of the step 12 step work. And I, and I started to feel better, but I'd still not dealt with the social anxiety, you know. And after that, I'd got a job, you know. You know, I quickly managed to get myself a job in a call centre. And that's when I realised the social anxiety was a major issue because I started that job. And any time anybody came over to speak to me, I'd go bright red in the face, which is embarrassing in itself, you know. Yeah. <laughs> really embarrassing yeah. in itself and on on my dinner hour I used to leave the office and just walk around on my own for an hour because I was like I'd rather do that than be in the painful situation of having to sit in an office dinner room and make small talk with these people that I'm working with but I knew that part of me is a really sociable guy so it was strange. It's like I'm, I've got this massive block and these all these fears here, but one part of me is wanting the social connection and the other part hates it. Why do you think you were doing that? I know now because of the experiences that I'd had and the limiting decisions that I'd made, which which created the beliefs that I had, you know, the beliefs that, my beliefs at that time, looking back now, was everyone's more intelligent than me. Everyone's going to laugh at me. I'm worthless and I'm just not good enough. Mm. And people don't accept me for who I am. They were the beliefs that I had that were holding me back, keeping me trapped in that cycle of of social anxiety. How old were you at this time, Mark, when you got this job then? So I would have been then... 20 about 20 28 29 all right around that time so, yeah. how, how old were you when you first contacted na so that i would have been about 27 because it was i'd gone to the na meetings i did the 30 days and then once i'd finished the 30 days i was you know i was just literally ready to go out and get a job again so it was shortly after that really so the, so the, the listeners who have listened to everything here, right? Mm-hmm. So you should be picking up there that, so this has been going on for Mark over a decade, yeah. over a decade, right? And he's gone through that, all that initial abuse, starting using drugs at a, a young age, getting into all them cycles, becoming homeless, because you mentioned about the homeless living yes. in a tent. Yeah, yeah. So that's a decade, right? Yet you still were able to turn that around. Yes. You were still able to do it. Yes. Because there's gonna there's gonna be people, no doubt, whether that's when this first comes out, a year down the line, two years down the line, there's gonna be people who are gonna listen to this and they might be in similar situations. And mm-hmm. quite often what a lot of us do as humans, we always tell ourselves that our situation is worse than everyone else's and that there's no way that we'll be able to get out. Other people can, but we can't, don't we? Uh, yes. Yet Mark is a living proof. He's he's been. It's you know we're not talking about he you know he had a bad year. We're talking about a decade, a decade of it. Yet he's still completely turned it around. So I really want to emphasise this on how much inspiration, hope that should give you if you're listening to this right now. Really should give you hope. If Mark can do it, you can do it. Mm-hmm. So Mark, when when 
So I just mentioned about the tent then. So how, how, did, how did it come that, you know, you ended up living in a tent? Was mm. that literally just everything's gone or? Yeah. So when I lived with Sam, so Sam lived in a small bed set. She had five Jack Russell dogs. She had a girlfriend living with her. We had our friend Ashley living there and it was, it become a very toxic environment. So they were just, Sue and Sam used to fall out that much to the point where they, there was knives drawn out. The police were around. They nearly killed each other and they would scream and shout at each other that much. Sometimes I had full blown panic attacks. I remember laying on the bathroom floor one night because, you know, in a full blown panic attack where, you know, you get this thing when you, if any of the listeners have ever had full panic attacks, your fingers curl up because the oxygen's mm-hmm. rushing from your hands. And that had become on a regular basis. And I had nowhere to go. I had nowhere else to go. So I had no option but to sleep in the tent. And Sam lived on the back of a five mile country park called Reddish Vale. So I just, it was easier for me to just sleep in that tent outside than live in the house how long Um, were you doing that for so that was months really i can't remember exactly how long now but it was months months before i'd got my own place because then you know being in that situation having no money you know eating out of supermarket skips going to wellsprings soup kitchen in stockport who i have so much gratitude for that place because i wouldn't have ate without them And it wasn't until I thought, you know, I can't continue living like this. And then that's when I started doing the escorting. And then I had the money then to be able to get my own, you know, my own place. And that's when I moved into the flat. How did that escorting start then? Was that something you were going, you kind of got to a desperation stage to do it? Or did someone kind of push you into it? I mean, how did that happen? Yeah, nobody pushed me into it. I met a a friend from going out in, in Manchester and he was an escort. And I just got into conversations with him and asked him, you know, where he was advertising. And then I started to do the same and then started to, you know, quickly make money from it, really. So, yeah, that's how I'd I'd got into it. But again, that was a real, I mean, some of the situations that I put myself in were just, when I look back now, so dangerous. I could have been meeting anybody. Yeah, really, really dangerous situations. Mm. How long was that going on? So that had gone on for a number of years, really. You know, I moved in the flat. How long was I in the flat for? I was in the flat for five years in total. And the escort in itself probably went on for about, you know, for about three years. I mean, I had done, I had worked in the sex industry before that. Do you know what I mean? But nothing, you know, nothing major, really. That's when it had become, you know, sort of full time Mm. you know sort of doing that and you know a mix with the drugs that was the downfall of it you know because i'm all for people that want to actually do that but when you're in a position of being in drug addiction it's just you know it's it's it lowers your self-confidence even more than it is already do you know what i mean and it's just bad. it's just a bad place i mean i remember being in that flat and it's the only ever time it had crossed my mind and because I'd, you know, I'd bro- I'd fallen out with my family and everything. I'd used them for money. I'd, you know, I'd borrowed that much money off them that, you know, they weren't prepared to help me anymore. And mm. I got to a really low point where I remember, and I wouldn't have done it, but it, it was there on my mind. And I just thought, if I jump out of that window right now in this flat, nobody's going to miss me. Nobody's going to even know that. Well, they would have known that I were gone, but I just thought nobody's going to miss me. And I just think, you know, talking about it now, if I would have carried on like that, I wouldn't have been here. I wouldn't have been here now. And if you if you would have done that, I mean, looking back now, what impact do you think that would have had on everyone? Yeah, it would have destroyed my nan. It would have completely destroyed her and my mom. Yeah, and it's one of them things, isn't it, where... Because I I've been in that really really low place myself, yeah. contemplating suicide, and when when you're in that place, I know people talk about how selfish suicide is, but unless you've been in that place and you feel that low, yeah, you and you almost convince yourself that everyone else is better off without you and that you're a drain on them and things like that, 
And certainly if you're listening to this, that is not the case. And again, Mm -hmm. Mark has gone through that and, you know, look at what he's doing now, right? With all these other things going on, he's still turned that around. Yeah. So no matter how long you've been in that situation, it can be turned around. It absolutely can be turned around. And certainly, as you heard from Mark then, is when he can look back on that now and he knows the impact that would have had. But at the time, it's not so clear, is it? You've got to convince yourself that it's for the best and it's that and the other, but it's certainly not. It's certainly not. And if you feel it, you know, if you are feeling down, please do reach out to people, you know, specialists, professionals online. Don't, don't suffer alone. So this 12 week program you did, how, how hard was that to do? I wouldn't say it was hard. It would have been hard without the 12 week program. Because, you know, going back to what you were saying before, Ross, about your social circles, when you're in a 12 week program, everyone's there for one purpose, for recovery. Mm. And everyone's going through it together. And I'd met a completely new group of people. You know, we would meet up to go out for food, which is something that I'd not done in years. You know, I'd not really gone out for food because I wasn't really interested in food because of all the drugs. So it was just nice to, you know, to sort of to sort of do that. I did find it really difficult and challenging, though, to do that. But I pushed myself to do it because of the anxiety of being around people. Mm. I did find it really, really difficult, but I just I just pushed through the anxiety. And I think by going to the meetings, that was it was good to get over the addiction, but it was also training me to get over the social anxiety as well, because it was exposure therapy. You know, I was. I was pushing myself into those situations, no matter how fearful, no matter how much my heart raced, I would sit there and I would go for a meal with these guys and and sit there and just talk. And I would go red in the face and I would blush and, you know, I would stutter over my words, but I just, I just pushed through it and did it anyway. Felt the fear and did it anyway, as they say. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, as coaches, we know the power of taking action. Yes. So a lot of people obviously often go on about if you look at it like your thoughts, it's very difficult to control your thoughts because they just happen instantly, don't they? Yes. Right. And your thoughts always affect your feelings. And then, of course, your feelings affect your actions. Right. So if you put yourself in in that kind of mindset, so you think Mark's been going through all this stuff, how easy would it have been for you to just be like, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to stay where I am. Yeah, I'm not good enough. I can't do it because of X, Y, Z. I can't do it because of all, everything I've been through. But the key point there is Mark took an action towards towards where he wanted to be, mm-hmm. which was out of all that, not mm-hmm. using drugs, not in the sex industry, not on the brink of becoming homeless through having psychosis and all these other things going on. He took an action towards where he wanted to go now if you would have been asked at the start that that, you know you had to sign up for two years and you had to do that like that would have been too much right and it would have made it really difficult but you were given actionable steps and all you had to do really was get through to the next day didn't you yeah you had to be there the, the next day and one of the other key things mark was saying about is obviously we've mentioned again about these social circles so when he's putting himself with other people who are recovering so Therefore, they're people that are not, they're not using, they are all trying to make themselves better. They're not all being negative. They're all trying to get out of it. And when you've got a community like that, that's what helps you. They're your cheerleaders. They bring you out. They pick you up when you fall down. So if, if you're listening to that, reach You know, there's lots of groups on Facebook. There's obviously lots of coaches. There's lots of people you can reach out to that can help you out of these situations. Yeah, you don't have to do it alone. And for, you know, for years, the kind of the way of the world, a lot of things have been about, you know, oh yeah, you can't show your emotions. It's that, that's all rubbish. Yeah. Yeah. You've heard that it's okay not to be okay. It's okay to ask for help. It's okay to ask for help, but there's definitely strength in numbers, isn't there, Mark? Strength in numbers. Yes, there certainly is. 100%. So 
with the anxiety, so when you started working this job and you were talking about how you were taking yourself away from it, how did you, because obviously I know what you're like now. I mean, how have you gone from that to there? Mm. So I, that job, you know, I was anxious all the way through and I didn't really stay there that long. The place was very dodgy anyway. It was a debt management company um, and the the practices at the company were just, it, it, yeah, it was very, very dodgy. So, you know, and I'd left, didn't stay there very long. And then I met my partner who, you know, we've been together now, we're coming into eight years in in december this year I'm like wow so i met my partner and then i ended up moving over to chester and you know i'd when i moved over when i met tony and i moved over to chester i had to face all of my insecurities because i'd had a number of relationships and as you can imagine you you can sometimes be what you attract all of the relationships that i'd had were bad you know, sometimes I'd been bad in the relationships, you know, I'd not been a complete angel. You know, sometimes I'd lie to people and they'd all, they were just all really toxic relationships. And then I met Tony and for the first time, this person's come into my life who doesn't want to lie to me, doesn't want to abuse me and is treating me with respect. I couldn't take it in my mind because I was like, I don't deserve this. And um, so I thought that he was going to leave for somebody else all the time when it became mm -hmm. a, a real bad obsession that you know really bad insecurities at the time and I actually went I paid to go and see a private counsellor for and that went on for like over a year but she was also a trained coach and an NLP practitioner um, and I was like, wow, when I made so much progress um, within that year, I'd made a massive amount of progress. And the social anxiety, I got to the point where, you know, the blushing had stopped, you know, I could talk to people confidently, but I still had a fear of public speaking, which didn't bother me too much until I was in jobs and I had to, you know, talk at the front. I used to dread that first week when you're going into that training room the first week and you're thinking, I'm going to have to stand up and present in front of people. I'm going to have to tell people about me and who I am. I used to hate mm. that. So then I came across ECM and I decided to do my coaching accreditation. Just now, for the listeners... Yeah. Just, I was just thinking because oh, being coaches, we're probably naturally doing this. Yeah. The, ac the acronym TCM, that's the coaching masters. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> just in case anyone doesn't know. Yeah. Um, that, that's who we're referring to. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Rod. So, yeah. So I'd started my coaching accreditation with them. Now, as part of the coaching accreditation, as you'll know, Ross, you do a two hour workshop every week. Yeah. Now, when I first did that two hour workshop and this 40 faces on Zoom staring at me, oh my God, I'm expected to talk in front of all those people. I was shaking. I had massive sweat patches underneath my arms. My heart was racing 10 to the dozen. And I thought, you know what? I just want to make every excuse I can so I don't have to put myself through this painful scenario of, you know, of talking in front of all of these people. And as I'd gone through that 12 week accreditation, I was being coached every week and I was seeing, you know, practice clients, you know, and, and I was being coached by other people and I made, I made a lot of progress throughout that 12 weeks. You know, I'd got to the point where I felt comfortable being able to talk on a zoom. Yeah. I'd managed to get over that hurdle. Then not long after I did that accreditation, Liam James Collins, who's one of the founders of the Coaching Masters, was looking for somebody who had already studied NL NLP practitioner, but not with TCM. Now, I'd done a short um, NLP practitioner course that wasn't really worth much. Do you know what I mean? It was a very short course, but I'd got the papers for it and... Liam said to me, Mark, I've got a good opportunity for you if you want it. He said, 
I'm going to give you the opportunity to become an NLP trainer because I'm being trained by ABNLP and I need somebody to come along with me. And I was like, oh my God, this is a really good opportunity. But have I, have I, can I really stand up and talk and deliver a bloody training? Because as part of that, I mean, that course was six months of NLP practitioner, NLP master and trainer level. It was two hour Zooms, sometimes twice a week. It was in-person meetups down in Kent. And as part of the evaluation weekend, which was a two day evaluation, we had a six hour closed book assessment, closed book, six hours of writing. And then the second day we had to deliver two presentations in front of all of these people on two topics of NLP. And they had to be 30, 30 minutes, no more, no less. I'm just thinking, Mark, just in case it's only just dawned on me. In case people don't know what NLP is, yes. it's Neuro Linguistic <laughs> Programming, programming. And it would absolutely change your life if you know nothing yeah. about it. Yes. You want to be you want to be <laughs> turning them ears up and really listening to this because Mark yeah. is like, Yeah, so listen in. Listen in. Yeah. So NLP, I like to describe it as an instruction manual for the mind. It's mm, literally a, it's literally a toolbox full of techniques that you can use to really help change your beliefs and your thought processes at an unconscious level, creating massive change. So, you know, and I'm testament to this because as I was going throughout the training, we had to use the NLP techniques on each other and get really, really confident with the NLP techniques to be able to teach them. And the big turning point for me when I knew that I'd made a lot of progress is when it was my evaluate evaluation weekend and I stood up to do those two presentations, I just did it so confidently. And after I'd done those two trainings, I burst out crying because it was one of those moments where I didn't recognize who I was anymore in a good way. And I realized that all of the coaching that I'd had, all of the NLP, all of the self-hypnosis had worked for me massively. And I knew at that moment that that was my niche. I knew that I wanted to help other entrepreneurs who were feeling the pain of not being able to put themselves out there online confidently and not being able to, you know, to talk in front of people, get over those fears so they can, so they can grow the business. Because as you'll know, Ross, I mean, you're very visible online and it's important. We need to be visible because if we're not visible, people can't know, like, and trust us. And that's when I decided on my coaching niche then. Yeah. So, and that brings me up to today. Mark, honestly, it's, <laughs> it's been such a good story. Like, even the bits you you'd kind of you know you give me a few headlines beforehand and it's like you barely barely scrape the surface i generally think the listeners would have been blown away from this there's so much in there to unpack i mean i think we could probably talk for days on on most of it yeah i mean it's so much what is important at the, the end there guys is if you if you notice even now when mark was talking about all them steps he had to go through with that nlp right he's talking about all that now you might have been listening to that and going oh, i couldn't do that and there would have 100 percent been a time when mark was saying he couldn't do that oh yeah definitely like i mean if i look back at mark in let's say age 25 I always say, I always say, Ross, that the life I'm living now at one point was a dream to me. I didn't believe that the life I'm living now was possible. When I was sleeping in that tent on the back garden, do you know what I mean? With a huge amphetamine addiction, I, the only thing I, I dreamed and wanted was to have a nice warm house and ideally one day to be able to work from home and that's what I've got and I remind myself of that because sometimes we can forget where we are and we can take things for granted we all do it don't yeah. we I mean um, that's about I, I touch on that quite a lot with my clients is about mm. gratitude 
Because yeah. I remember personally, like that was a massive, massive shift for me. It's very easy to get caught up in kind of how society wants you to be with like news and all these adverts. And you're basically almost trained to always be looking to try and get something more. And quite often there, that's material things, isn't it? And I remember when I had this real breakthrough with that and I was like, I'm so grateful for where I am already. And the more work I did with like gratitude, I would, I'd wake up in the morning and I actually started a book that I wrote, not as in a book for other people, but my own book. And I called it the book of magic, right? Because it was like magic to me because I would literally wake up and I'd be like, I'm so grateful. I've been given another day to see my kids. I'm so grateful I've got eyesight that I can see them, that I, I'm able to think for myself. I'm so grateful I can go downstairs and get a glass of water because some people can't even do that. And when you express and feel the gratitude for them things that most people take for granted, you find that the universe will just give more and more because you're already grateful for what you got and you're not just desperate to get them other things. So then things are drawn to you because your energy changes, doesn't it? Um, it does. It certainly does. And it changes your mindset as well. You know, I think when I'm, when I'm regularly practicing gratitude on a, on a regular consistent basis, I just feel so much more content mm. in my life, you know, and that ca it actually came up in a coaching session for me not so long ago, actually with, you know, cause I was being coached, you know, I think coaches sometimes need, we need coaching ourselves, don't we? Yeah. And, and it came up really that I had slipped into that place of where I was thinking, I'm not exactly where I want to be. I'm getting there, but I'm not exactly where I want to be. And I just, I just thought, do you know what? I am where I want to be because this is more than I've ever had. Um, mm -hmm. And gratitude gives you that power to be happy with where you're at, where and where you are in life. And for the people that are listening to this that have had coaching themselves, you'll know that when somebody holds space for you in a coaching session, you really have that time to have those breakthroughs and think about the gratitude and everything that you've got in your life, don't you? You come up, you think of things that you wouldn't normally think of in a in a day to day conversation. Yeah, and that's what if, if many of the listeners would have probably never done coaching they might have heard of it or had some kind of weird aspect of it through work through these random places that job places do but it's one of them situations where you get to talk to someone in a way that you probably have never spoke to anyone before because when you talk to friends and that they just they give you advice and they tell you what you want to hear which the biggest breakthroughs you have is when you figure things out for yourself by being asked powerful questions at the right time isn't it yeah. And yeah, so that's just a little a little pointer for people if if you're wondering why we mentioned coaching, because that is what has changed our lives. Yes. Uh, <laughs> quite quite <laughs> simply, really, isn't it? <laughs> and a real important point that Mark was ending on with all that was about there was a time where where he is now was a dream. Yeah. He was absolute rock bottom, if you don't mind me saying, you know, mm -hmm. you felt your rock bottom with what's going on. Mm -hmm. And he's completely and utterly turned that around. So I really hope that the listeners get some real inspiration for that and realize how far you can come. And no one is saying it's easy. But by taking a few small, consistent steps, it is achievable. Yeah. Mark, how, where can people find you? So you can find me. I did used to use Instagram a lot, but I don't use it much anymore. So your best place to find me and follow me is on Facebook. So if you type in Mark Adam Snell, which is S for sugar, N for November, E for echo, L, L. And then, yeah, you'll find me there and just pop me over a friend request. I'm always up for uh, new connections. And if you want to ask me any questions, then feel free to shoot me and I'll answer any questions that you guys have got. Mark, you've been amazing. I'm going to ask you one last question, okay? Which would just be about what advice would you give someone who's currently facing their own challenges that's seeking to have that breakthrough? So for anybody that's going through addiction or that's going through low confidence and, and anxiety, which normally comes along with addiction, you can get stuck in a cycle of thinking, oh, I'm, you know, I'm scared to stop taking the drugs. I'm scared to get the help. 
do it 100% because it's the first day of the rest of your life. It really is. And even if the withdrawal symptoms are bad at the beginning, it is so worth it because as each day goes by, you become more grateful, you become more happy, you start getting your natural energy levels back, you start getting your self-worth back as well. Um, and it's just it's just so worth it, you know? And even if all of your friends are taking drugs out there, you can be the one to pull away from that. You can. And you'll be very surprised, even though you might not believe in yourself right now at the moment, you'll be surprised with the things that you'll be able to manifest and create in your life because you'll be able to turn all of those adversities that you've had into into assets to be able to help yourself and to help other people. If it's in relation to public speaking, the one, and I know it sounds a bit cliche, feel the fear and do it anyway. You know, with public speaking, you are, and with any fears, you've got to take the action. You've got to get used to being uncomfortable and to, and to, and to get comfortable with that and to just do it. But what I would say is anybody that's fearful of public speaking, okay, and this is a great analogy that I like to use. When you go to the gym, you wouldn't go to the gym and squat 200 kilograms of weight if you've never been to the gym before because that would be really uncomfortable you know you'd probably fall to the ground and injure yourself you would start out with maybe 10 kilograms 15 kilograms and then go up to 20 and you'd go up slowly and learning to become an effective speaker whether that's online or in person is exactly the same you know, ask yourself, you know, have you ever posted a picture of yourself on social media? If this is what you're wanting to do, if you're wanting to get better with showing up online, if you've not, that's your starting point. Post a picture. Once you've got used to posting a picture, then move up to the next step and post like a, a 10 second video of yourself online, you know, and then eventually once you've got used to that, then go on to the lives but you have to start somewhere. You don't have to jump in at the deep end. Just start somewhere and build yourself up. I do that with, uh, I've got a Facebook community and we I use it now just for comfort zone challenges. And people can go inside that group. They can do lives inside that group because it's a very small community of people that all feel the same. So expose yourself in those smaller groups, in those smaller situations. And over time, your confidence will 100% grow. Mark, what is your Facebook group if anyone's listening and wants to join that? Yeah, so it's called VIP Fearless Speakers. I can 100% vouch what Mark is saying. I remember there was a time where I was literally like, there's no way I could post a picture of myself online, this, that, and the other. I wouldn't want to do it, you know, once I started get moving into this world. And now I do I don't even think about it. I do videos. I was saying to Mark before this, a lot of my videos that you see online, I do in one take. So I don't mind if I make mistakes. Yeah. Unless I did the entire thing so you couldn't even understand what I was saying. It's rare. So I would just put it out because I'm okay with that. Yeah. And I have found one hundred percent with what Mark said is the more you put yourself out of your comfort zone, the more you grow. That is where the growth comes and you overcome them fears by doing that because then that fear you realize it's not real yes it doesn't exist exactly Mark, you've been absolutely amazing on this podcast you've said some really 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 empowering ads throughout i think it's just gonna really help people for years to come your journeys are complete and utter testament to your strength and resilience. It's unbelievable. And I'm certain the listeners would have really enjoyed this show and found a lot of inspiration from your story. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. You're welcome, Ross. It's been brilliant to be on your podcast as well. It has. And thank you for allowing me to uh, share my story. You're very welcome. Until next time, everyone, I hope you enjoyed this and I will see you next week. Thank you for joining us today on this episode of the Bounce Back to Breakthrough podcast and for allowing us on this journey of life with you. 
If you found today's episode helpful, make sure to subscribe to our podcast so you never miss an inspiring story. And don't forget to visit our website at www.rossrolf.com. Until next time, remember, no matter where you are on your own journey, there's always the potential for a breakthrough. I believe in you. You've got this. Thank you.